This is a virtual presentation for the Constructed Environment Conference in Chicago for 2011. The topic is Classrooms, Natural Phenomena, and Experiential Learning, Integrating Learning with Nature into the Classroom. I am Kelly Brooks, an Adjunct Assistant Professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Architecture. Current research in education shows that experiential learning, a theory developed by Jean Piaget that places value on the primacy of authentic experience, is an effective educational method that leads to meaningful and long-lasting learning. Experiential environment-based learning, which promotes inquiry-based observation and analysis, has been shown to promote retained knowledge, increased engagement and enthusiasm for learning, and promote concern for the environment while providing an antidote to society's increasing detachment from nature. Outdoor education promotes experiential learning and fosters direct contact with natural phenomena. I would like to highlight a critical aspect of contemporary environmental education, to view nature not as a subject to learn about, but as a tool to learn with. Rather than relying on occasional outdoor excursion, as the current pedagogy suggests, Classrooms should provide direct interaction with natural phenomena in order to allow students to develop a deep understanding of traditional subject matter while reflecting on the directness and complexity of their experiences. It's not just the access to outdoors that is important, but the proximal relationship of natural phenomena to the learning environment. Contact with the natural environment is critical to human cognitive development and by extension one's ability to learn to learn. Outdoor deficit behavior is a condition identified by Richard Louv in his book, Last Child in the Woods. As we lead increasingly interior lives, technology has become a proxy for direct experience. It is the province of design to recognize the effects of this trend on the human psyche and the responsibility of designers to pose solutions to this condition. It's important to consider the role of the classroom in this solution, as it is here that the majority of educational instruction occurs. Unless we eliminate the classroom altogether, as some who claim it's obsolete say we should, it's critical to set forth strategies for making classrooms more experiential and specifically to place students in sensorial contact with natural phenomena. The following is an attempt to characterize school building and classroom types relative to the time period and their relationship to the environment. The first type, the one-room schoolhouse from the 18th and 19th century, Schools were decentralized with no federal oversight. Schools were a community center for rural communities. Parents had the responsibility for the school, like repairing buildings, providing firewood and heating, and building desks. Teachers often lived with local families, rotating household to household. Schools consisted of one single class of 10 to 40 students of mixed ages. Windows were the only source of lighting, and every wall had an opening to the outdoors. Because these schools consisted of only one room, there were no corridors and few barriers to the outdoors. This school type was put out of date in part by motorized school buses in the 1920s. The second model, the Ford model from the early 20th century. In 1918, all states passed a law requiring children to attend at least elementary school, which required many more schools. Before 1930, an average school size was less than 100. The purpose of schools was to train workers for an industrial economy. In the model referred to as cells and bells, classrooms were arranged in a linear fashion based on an assembly line. Students moved from one subject to the next at a set interval marked by bells ringing. Learning was thought to occur via transmission of knowledge from teacher to student in a linear fashion. Every classroom had a large amount of windows because they were the primary source of lighting. Furniture arrangement was hierarchical, consisting primarily of individual desks. Because the buildings were larger and many of the functions of the school became centralized, there were fewer items associated with the home, like centralized heating, janitor, and supply closets for cleaning, etc. The third model, uh, the modern type from 1940 to 1970, schools became more centralized. In 1940, there were 117,000 school districts, and in 1970, there were 19,000. The average school size increased fivefold from less than 100 in 1930 to 450 in 1970. Elementary schools became predominantly single-story buildings. 
Classrooms typically had a door opening directly to the outdoors, not via a corridor, connected to a space for outdoor learning. Large amounts of glass allowed transparency and openness. The furniture arrangement was more flexible than in the previous models, but still consisted mostly of individual desks. Classrooms of this type had electric lighting, but typically not air conditioning. An extreme change occurs in school building design as a reflection of the changing school system in a post-war society. American school designers were influenced by progressive design methods from abroad, in particular British wartime school designs. Many of the changes in British school designs were strongly influenced by post-war economic policies such as garden allotments and health policies such as open-air schools for tuberculosis patients. The next model, uh, the contemporary type from 1980 to present, schools continued to become more centralized. In 1990, there were 15,000 school districts and school sizes remain large, approximately 450 students although since the mid-90s there's been a trend toward reducing school size. Some significant changes in the physical environment of schools include increased security requirements, air conditioning is used in classrooms, which results in buildings with fewer windows and openings to the outdoors. More parents drive their children to school than in previous generations. These factors result in sprawling single-story schools with few openings and very little connection to the outdoors. Corridors are typically indoors, even in warm climates. Furniture arrangement is more flexible and typically seating occurs in groups rather than at individual desks. Many more elements are introduced into classrooms. Carpeting for sitting on, group work tables, fixed and interactive wall displays, banks of computers, classroom pets, and indoor plants. Based on this historical survey, in regards to their connection to the environment, the earliest classroom type, the one-room schoolhouse, was the most connected. This type was much smaller with fewer components and thus more directly connected to their community and surrounding environment than the subsequent types. Because the entire school consisted of one room, there was no need for corridors and other spaces to insulate the classroom and the outdoors. Each classroom relied on operable windows to provide daylight and ventilation. The modern type has the strongest connection to the environment. Although schools at this time were designed to seamlessly connect to the outdoors in a more sophisticated way than in the one-room schoolhouse, school sizes were much larger in the 19th, than in the 19th uh, century and required many more components, offices, storage, libraries, etc. Single-story buildings were, with large amounts of clear glass allowed transparency and openness. These characteristics symbolized social equality, democratic and healthy environments, and expressed optimism about the openness and availability of education. The Ford model type and the contemporary type are far behind in their connection to the environment. Despite the rigid, symmetrical layout of schools from this era, they exhibit a stronger connection to the natural phenomena than the subsequent contemporary type. This is primarily due to the need for large windows to provide natural light and ventilation. Similar to the one-room schoolhouse type, the Ford model type is striking in its simplicity. There were less movable objects in the room and the furniture layout was orderly and hierarchical. The contemporary type shows the least connection between classroom and the natural environment. Policies in education such as No Child Left Behind have resulted in an emphasis on memorization at the expense of experiential learning. There have been a substantial increase in school size and a fundamental change in education philosophy, which both are reflected in more rigid, multi-layered buildings, vertically and horizontally. The prevalence of air conditioning in schools had a major impact on the changing school type. School buildings are less open in general. Classrooms are much more cluttered than in the modern type and have a much more flexible layout. This orderlessness distracts from the present of, na of nature outside. In addition to these physical elements, policy in education has contributed to this as well. The contemporary classroom type reflects dominant changes in American society and lifestyle. Over time, each classroom type has become more and more specifically designed for its current internal needs. With increasing specialization, something is lost. Even though the one-room schoolhouse type appears more rigid and less flexible than the contemporary type, it employs indeterminate or cooperative space. Because there were fewer specific programmatic elements, 
the space was less differentiated and allowed for interpretation or customization. This is a meaningful difference because it allowed for dynamic elements and chance occurrences. Can you imagine a town meeting or political speech being held in today's contemporary classroom? Although not the primary focus of this presentation, these spatial characteristics are mentioned because they allow for the participation of natural phenomena. When a room tells us exactly how to use it, there's very little room for discovery and personal adaptation. In our quest to make classrooms more up-to-date, we've eliminated the opportunity for dynamic relationships. There are substantial technological changes in contemporary classroom design aimed to improve student health and academic performance. Green design standards for schools, like all public buildings, are becoming mandatory to meet environmental and health standards. The measurable benefits of daylighting and air quality in classrooms have helped to make these common elements of most new classrooms. In the past 10 years, there are more, school, more schools, a reverse trend since 2000. Even though there are fewer districts, there are more schools with fewer students in each. There is a general movement toward less hierarchical learning environments away from the student as vessel to be filled. Contemporary progressive classroom design often includes flexible and adaptable spaces that are learner-centered. Shared space and resources facilitate team teaching. Place-based education allows direct engagement with places and circumstances and is thought to promote individual engagement via real life situations. All of these current directions in classroom design support connections to the natural environment. In summary, there has continually been a progressive minority view that the natural environment should play a strong role in education. Except for a brief period which paralleled the modern architecture movement, the relationship between the environment and classroom was not considered of primary importance. Today, there is more interest and in agreed upon benefits of environmental education, but classrooms themselves are less connected to the environment than at any other period in US history. Despite many positive trends in outdoor curriculum and school design, such as green schools and healthy schools, which are focused primarily on a checklist of prescriptive items, contemporary classrooms often do not reflect important current directions in educational philosophy toward experiential learning. Despite the positive current movement toward environmental or outdoor education, a change must be made in the classroom unit itself. Why should dynamic learning with the natural environment happen only during excursions away from the classroom home base? The physical form of the classroom can facilitate meaningful connections between the growing creative brain and nature. The engagement and retention of traditional subjects can be improved in an environment which allows for natural phenomena to be an active participant. How can classrooms be designed to allow for this critical connection to be made? The following are some proposed guidelines. This is not a complete list, but is intended to provide some specific examples that allow that for dynamic learning with the natural environment. Provide openings to nature at the child's scale create seamless transitions between classroom and the outdoors, bring natural phenomena into the classroom, give architectural definition to outdoor spaces, make structured outdoor spaces for group activity other than play, bring nature inside the classroom, provide situations that capture natural chance occurrences, provide child scale furniture and learning tools outside, take the classroom outside. That's the end of this presentation. Thank you very much.